Hello, and thanks for joining us for this special edition of Cronkite News. I'm Christiana Fadul. Cronkite News is committed to bringing you reports on the consumer beat. And tonight, we look at some of our top stories on protecting the health, wealth, and livelihood of Arizonans statewide. People struggling with addiction now have new resources to help them in their fight. And Kirika and Marnier shows us how new technology is being used to provide more people with access to health care. According to the American Society of Addiction Medicine, more than 2 million people in the U.S. were addicted to prescription pain medicine in 2016. Janet Major works for the Arizona Telemedicine Program, and she says that with telehealth, a technology that allows health care workers to serve patients via telecommunications, distance is no object. We have people traveling several hours from the White Mountains or from other areas here in Arizona to do a five-minute pre- or post-surgery checkup when we have technology that allows us to do the same thing at a distance without them having to put gas in the she, car. She says she hopes to see this technology not just in clinics, but in homes in the future. In Glendale, in Kiriko Marnia, Cronkite News. ...says that studies show some patients prefer telehealth because it is less intimidating. After last week's elections and monumental wins for the transgender community, a transgender congressional candidate held a panel here in the Valley. Reporter Emily Richardson tells us how the norms of politics are changing. We're in the middle of Transgender Awareness Week, and to celebrate it, local members of the LGBTQ community gathered to discuss and explore issues they face in society. We have doctors, lawyers, nurses, construction workers. I'm, I transitioned while I was a police sergeant. According to the Williams Institute, 1.4 million adults in the United States identify as transgender. To help make the public more aware, Brianna Westbrook, a congressional candidate, and other members of the LGBTQ community came together to have a conversation about transgender's rights. As it creates social change. Um, it is the conversation that brings progress. Stephanie Sherwood is a transgender woman who transitioned four years ago, but her first memory of struggling with her gender was in kindergarten. And there was a child who was painted an easel, and I thought, that looks fun, I want to do that. And so she took uh, kind of a smock thing and put it over my clothes so I wouldn't get paint on me, and I freaked out because it looked like a dress to me, and I remember, I still vividly remember thinking, Oh my God, people are going to see me in this and know I want to be a girl. Sherwood believes her coming out experience was easier than it is for most, but says it put her career in jeopardy. At the police department, there were, no, no one said anything to me, but there were people who had gone to the, to the union and also to the chief and asked them to stop me from transitioning. Members of the LGBTQ community believe the social norms are changing and soon being transgender will be accepted on a national scale. Because you have candidates like myself, and other candidates across this country that are standing up for LGBT rights to bring the progress we need to create a better future. The public perception of transgender people has absolutely changed. Transgender Awareness Week leads up to Transgender Day of Remembrance on November 20th, honoring those who lost their lives to hate crimes. According to the Human Rights Campaign, so far this year, at least 25 transgender people have been violently killed. In the Broadcast Center, Emily Richardson, Cronkite News. The Equifax breach has affected millions of people, and scammers aren't stopping there. Reporter Mia Atkins found out how they're continuing to obtain personal information and what you can do to try and prevent it. Equifax is one of three major consumer credit reporting agencies. The company says people's names, credit card information, social security numbers, and other personal information has been accessed by the hackers this summer. They're just starting to notify people as to whether their information was compromised. Stephanie Netherwood is one of millions of people who have been affected by a data breach. She doesn't yet know if her information was again compromised by the latest breach of Equifax. Netherwood doesn't want to have to go through the process again. It took about two weeks of my life, and it was very stressful, very scary, and that was nothing compared to what this is. Netherwood and her husband Joe have taken the necessary precautions to keep themselves safe, but are concerned for those close to them. I'm really worried about my nieces and my nephews and young people because they need to buy houses, they need to buy cars, they need to, they need to have credit cards. 
and this is going to follow them around for the rest of their lives. Tyler Allen, a local attorney, believes the scammers will take advantage of this latest breach to pose as credit agency employees to get more personal information. Hey, we're from Equifax or we are from um, some type of credit monitoring system. Give us your information. We think you've been breached. We're here to help. There are places to get reliable information about how to handle issues like these. Michael Kokenauer, president and CEO of IT Synergy, hosts a webinar once a month. This month, he talked about Equifax. And we're talking about 143 million records. And so this is potentially hundreds of millions of dollars worth of data on the black market. Once that stuff starts to get sold, then it gets into the hands of a wider criminal community. Who knows what they might do with that? Netherwood is concerned that the people who are supposed to watch for your credit are the very ones who were hacked this time. They are the ones who were supposed to collect and keep it safe. And again, they just let it walk out the door. Equifax has announced they will waive all fees until November 21st for people who want to freeze their credit files. In addition, those we spoke to recommend you secure your information by checking your own credit report, keep an eye on your bank accounts for unusual activity, and don't give out any personal information over the phone or email. In the Broadcast Center, Mia Atkins, Cronkite News. Changes are coming to public transportation here in Phoenix. Changes that could help make it more user friendly. Cronkite News reporter Tatum Hubble got some insight into the future. Transportation 2050 is a 35 year plan in the city of Phoenix to advance transportation in the future. It is funded by taxpayers and improvements are already underway, including extending hours of use and making it easier for people with disabilities to ride. Under 2050, it was able to fund a new platform on the light rail uh, line at 50th Street, and that's going to directly serve Ability 360. Jacoby said that their main goal is to get people where they need to go faster. Thanks to the City of Phoenix taxpayers, light rail routes are being improved and busing hours are being extended. Two of our most ridden routes are going to be exp uh, have expanded frequency in October, and that's the um, Thomas and um, Camelback route. They're very, very well ridden routes. Riders are already noticing the improvements. I ride the light rail uh, probably about a couple times a week. I go from Mesa all the way to the end in Phoenix on 19th and Dunlap. I like that it gets me where I'm going a lot faster. The city says there's already an increase in riders due to the recent changes. In Phoenix, Tatum Hubble, Cronkite News. Make sure to check out valleymetro.org or download their app to keep up with your ride. The Las Vegas shooting is the big, deadliest mass shooting in modern U.S. history, and six of the ten deadliest incidents happened in the past ten years. Now, younger generations are sharing why they believe these occurrences have desensitized them. Reporter Alex Valdez joins us now in the broadcast center. Since the Las Vegas shooting, there have been four more mass shooting incidents where four or more people are shot. According to the data from gun violence archives, for millennials who grew up in the era of mass shootings, those we talked to say events of violence are just the new normal. To continually be bombarded with aggressive um, stories, events, violence, I think it is very easy to not be vigilant with those, not take notice, you become desensitized. Dr. Jennifer Gatt, a child psychologist, says the desensitization can start during childhood by being exposed to certain events. I talked to several students who say they see those symptoms in themselves. Have all these things that happen during our lifetime that it's just kind of, you know, that's the world we live in. And, you know, to expect something, is it surprising? No, it's just it's the world we live in. Millennials say mass shooting like the one that happened in Las Vegas are tragic, but these violent events are expected more now than they ever were. When it comes to mass shootings here in the United States, many millennials here at ASU share today that they see these events as just normal occurrences in their lifetime. It's sort of become like a regular thing, like we've become used to it. And it's sad to say how it is normalized to other people and just like it's a like awful thing that happened to everybody, but um, how it affects different people is sad. I'm not happy that it's being normalized. I, I, I wish we could reverse that, that trend. The way to reverse the trend starts early in life. We have access to violent video games and movies and, and music and social media. Um, I think the desensitization is, you know, certainly could happen at a younger age. 
Dr. Gatz says for anyone struggling emotionally after tragedy, she suggests that people self-monitor why they're feeling a certain way, then take action by seeking help from a doctor. In the Broadcast Center, Alex Valdez, Cronkite News. Meanwhile, people from the Valley are leaving to help victims in Puerto Rico. Our reporter Emily Bloom talked with some of them. Yeah, Maya, uh, the relief efforts there in Puerto Rico are just really struggling because of how severe the damage is. They're having a hard time even getting the supplies that they need to help them out across the island. While some areas do have power now, experts predict it will be months before the entire island is back up and running. Well, now some local Red Cross volunteers are gearing up to head out there. 13,000 Red Cross volunteers and workers have stepped forward in response to the three hurricanes that have rocked our nation in the last two months. And a few more are on their way. Compassion without training is its own disaster. Tom Batson works with volunteers for the Red Cross here in Arizona. The more tools they have before they get there, the better they are at providing that service delivery that we want for our clients. He is preparing five volunteers for deployment to Puerto Rico. It feeds your soul when you're able to help out people. And Derek Weber knows that firsthand. It was an awesome existential experience for me. He was motivated to help after his wife talked about donating to the Red Cross. I was like, well got a better idea. Two days later, he was in Houston passing out pizzas. Some people would cry and some people were, thank you, and the kids like couldn't believe it. And he is ready to head out again. Every volunteer goes through an online class, but those that are assigned a specialty task come here for some training that's a little bit more hands-on. Volunteer Rhonda Poshka will be volunteering for her first time. She was moved when she saw a close friend impacted by Harvey. Her house was basically submerged. She is a bit nervous as she heads to Puerto Rico, not knowing what to expect, but with a little recruitment. I have friends who originally are from Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and they're with me. She's got some support already. I feel like it's a new beginning for me. While volunteering on location is a huge support for those affected by these natural disasters, what you can do here should not be underestimated. These volunteers are headed to Puerto Rico sometime in the next few weeks, and Tom Batson, who we heard from in that story, predicts the Red Cross of Phoenix could have people there up to a year. For more information on how you can help out right here in Phoenix, head to redcross.org. I'm Jose Cardenas, host of Horizonte. Each week, we bring you experts and community leaders to discuss the issues that are vital to our community here in Arizona. We cover the stories that affect and inspire us and our families and talk to the newsmakers who shape the communities where we live. Horizonte is your source and your voice for what matters most here on Arizona PBS. As parts of Texas and Florida work to get back to normal following devastating hurricanes, hospitals are in desperate need of blood donations. As Nikirika Marinier reports, two organizations here in the Valley teamed up to help out. The recent hurricanes in Texas and Florida affected the country's blood supply. Blood drives that were supposed to be scheduled in those states because of the hurricanes um, didn't happen. So American Red Cross lost um, their blood supplies that would have came from those blood drives. With Red Cross's supply at critical levels, Thank you. Thank you. volunteer and blood drive planner Christine Aguilar knew something had to be done. Scheduling a blood drive takes um, at least three months. Um, for American Red Cross, they have to um, schedule their staff, so that's what takes a while. However, the Red Cross, in collaboration with the Phoenix Salvation Army, was able to schedule staff and find donors in only one week. Nancy Diela was a part of the collaboration efforts. It's really important right now because um, people that would normally give in the areas that have been affected aren't able to give, and so the ongoing needs for blood and plasma exist. I definitely don't like to watch when they put the needle in, but other than that, it's not too bad. Grace Barkley is a Salvation Army employee who left work to make a contribution. Something really important, and if I can sacrifice, you know, half an hour and an hour to help some people, then I definitely will. Aguilar feels that today's drive goes beyond just giving blood. Right now, our country really needs to come together and lend a hand to anybody who needs it. And obviously, Texas and Florida really need the help. Aguilar says that with blood levels being as low as they are, all blood types are in demand. In Phoenix, I'm in Kiriko Marina, Cronkite News. There were 20 donors at today's blood drive, according to Scott Johnson, public relations director for the Red Cross. He says each pint donated can save three lives. 
If you're looking to purchase a used car within the next few months, you could be sold a vehicle that was damaged in the recent natural disasters. Cronkite News reporter Availy Moore has more on what to look for to avoid getting scammed. Purchasing a new vehicle can be scary, especially if you don't know what to look for. Used car to see increases significantly after natural disasters, especially in places that don't know what to look for, such as Arizona. I purchased a uh, 96 Nissan Pathfinder um, for two grand um, with a fairly little list of issues um, that were disclosed to me by the owner. And then as I began to kind of have the vehicle and fix those issues, I discovered significantly more issues than were disclosed to me. You replaced the taillights, drained by about five gallons of water from my car between the two taillights. Hubner is just one of many who have gotten scammed while purchasing a used vehicle. Used car lots are also a target for deceiving vehicles, especially after a large storm. Understanding there's hurricanes and car accidents on an everyday situation, we have a company, it's called Carfax, and what we do is we actually put the serial number in the computer and it allows us to spit out all the items that happened to that car. Unfortunately, uh, the dealership is a big target, so we use that Carfax. It's 100% bulletproof. At Wright Honda in Scottsdale, Fleet Director Gary Kravitz is aware that these next few months will bring a heavy influx of well-camouflaged vehicles that were flooded in the recent storms. You have to be smart as a dealer. Obviously, we have 400 used cars going through our dealership, and we do a pretty rigorous walkthrough. We put the car on the hoist. Um, we go in it, we, we smell it. We, we try to really uh, protect the dealership. Again, we want to be honest, just like hopefully the consumer is honest. And be sure to have a mechanic you trust. Check the car for signs of water damage before you buy. In Phoenix, Bailey Moore, Cronkite News. One other tip, be prepared to walk away from the deal if things smell fishy. Literally, a flood damaged car might smell of mold or mildew. The Burton Bar Library may have had to temporarily shut down its doors due to a flood, but it won't be shutting down its books. Cronkite News reporter Bailey Moore talked with the city about its plans while the library continues its restoration process. You know, it's, it's just not the same. Yeah. It's you were, for years we were going there, for years, so. It has been about four months since Central Phoenix's Burton Bar Library closed its doors as a result of flooding, and the restoration process is still well underway. We started to get more information as to how long that was going to take to bring that building back onto full service. We were hearing from the community, from our customers, um, the impact that its closure had on Central Phoenix. Last week, Phoenix City Council unanimously voted upon a temporary location for Burton Bar to provide its services out of until the restoration process concludes. There are a lot of people that rely on Burton Bar for, um, for respite, for um, sanctuary. Uh, people define that on their own as they come in. The temporary location will be at Phoenix's Park Central Mall and will offer many of the services that the community depends on, like the music class for children. And they offer so many classes like, you know, Monday through Friday, which is amazing because we can go three times a week. They'll have the class 40 minutes and then they'll play for like another hour. So that gives them activity time. The library is passionate about being the library, Phoenix Public Library. We love what we do. We love our community. We love our customers. Um, we, we take what we provide to the community you know, very seriously and it's very heartfelt. Um, but so in this, yes, we are looking at, well, what are some good things that can come of it? In Phoenix, Bailey Moore, Cronkite News. The Burton Bar Library is expected to reopen in June of 2018. Until then, you can visit its pop-up location at Park Central Mall. Books in Braille are not as popular as they used to be for the thousands of visually impaired residents here in Arizona. Now many of the patrons are going digital. I went to a library in Phoenix that caters to this community to see the changes. Digital book players, flash drives, and DVDs line the shelves of this library. The Arizona State Braille and Talking Book Library serves 9,000 patrons, both the visually impaired and physically limited. So often people think when they become blind their life is over. And that's simply not the case. Um, and, and the reading service just allows a person to continue an activity that was a part of their life before 
losing their eyesight. Run, commanded Mrs. Arable, taking About 2,000 books, films, magazines come in each day. They then get sorted and another 2,000 go out to residents across Arizona. The patrons range in age from four to 106. The library officials say many of the younger patrons are embracing new technology and don't receive the physical collections anymore. We have people that read two books a day. We have people that read two books a month. We have people that read none of our books and only get magazines and newspapers. And we have people that didn't, doesn't do any of that and they only download all their materials through our library's BARD site. The library offers a program called BARD, a national program that allows patrons to download the material straight to their devices. Right now I have 180 books on my thumb drive. And although Christine Tuttle says some patrons find the digital system daunting, library employees and volunteers only make audio versions if patrons show enough demand for them. As part of the National Library Service, every state is equipped with a library for the visually impaired and physically limited. Christine Tuttle says it's available to anyone who can't read standard print, hold a book, or turn pages. From rotary to wall mounted to even the old Mickey Mouse phone, you can find all of those relics to the past in a new place. Cronkite News reporter Inkirka Marnier went to a museum that displays the phone's humble beginnings. What was your favorite one? The hamburger phone. Why is that? Because I love hamburgers. <laughs> Visitors walking through the telephone museum in Phoenix can pick their own favorite from the dozens of phones of the past century. Put a quarter in, you get a ball. Joe Hersey spent decades working in the telephone industry and is a part of the Telephone Pioneers, a nonprofit organization that has similar telephone museums in places like Denver, Albuquerque, and right here in Arizona. But last year, the future of these museums was unsure when their sponsor CenturyLink decided to cut the cord. In the business sense, we are not a, we are not a profit maker. We do not make money. CenturyLink provided a space for telephone museums to display the phones, but without the support, a few of the museums had to close. I didn't want to throw it all in a dumpster because that's where this whole thing was headed if we didn't find a home for it. Hersey and his team moved to the Pioneer Living History Museum in Phoenix, where they regularly host class tours. The majority of them that come in are very excited. There's a lot of hands-on displays that we use, so the kids are very, they seem interested in it. Uh, I like that you could see from that what, how phones have changed over time. It was nice to see how they worked and not just like, here's the phone, move on. While the kids say it's a cool place, Hersey says there's a lot more to it than that. Well, it's part of our history, and it's what sh it shows what, what we have built on to give your generation what you have today. <laughs> the move from the old building started in January, and the museum will have its grand opening later this month. More than 100 years have passed since Warren Ballpark opened in Bisbee, Arizona, but its history hasn't been forgotten. Cronkite News reporter Bridget Dow traveled to Bisbee where archaeology students are learning more about the historic field. Warren Ballpark opened in 1909 and is the longest continuously running ballpark in America. Through a partnership with Cochise College and Bisbee High School, one University of Arizona professor is digging up Bisbee's past. <laughs> While other students might spend their day off relaxing indoors, these young scientists are getting down in the dirt, looking for clues to Arizona's history. I think it's important to, to, to have a connection to our past. Um, it's, it's always very important. I, I think a lot of people feel like that. Um, and to be able to relate to, to where we came from, you know, who, who were, were our forefathers and and what did they do, and, and how, did, how did we get to where we are today? Robert Schoen, an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Arizona, says even though many famous ballplayers took to the field in Bisbee, he and his students are focused on the people who filled the stands here more than 100 years ago. We're digging underneath um, where stands used to be, or right now we have trenches uh, lined up just um, outside the grandstand uh, to see if uh, we can find anything that fans dropped. Uh, during their experience and what that might say about them. He and his team have already found several artifacts like a 1930s bus token and this old can top. Schoen says while the dig and its potential findings are interesting, more importantly, it's an opportunity for students to get hands-on experience 
like Bisbee High School sophomore Cecilia Garcia. I found a bone, but it wasn't a human bone, of course. But it was a, um, I think like a, a pig's bone or something like a, like someone was eating it or or something like that. But it was pretty big, and um, we found like an orange crush bottle and we could identify it. My grandfather said that he remembered that. Schoen says the dig has enough funding to continue through the spring semester. <laughs> Schoen says through the artifacts, they can learn more about the local economy back then, as well as where products sold at the old concessions were manufactured. Bridget Dowd, Cronkite News. Halloween is tomorrow, but some Valley kids would have missed the chance to dress up and go trick or treating if it weren't for a local nonprofit. Our Sierra Delgado was there as the kids were given Halloween costumes so they can celebrate the spooky holiday. Pumpkin For struggling families, buying Halloween costumes can be an extravagance. But thanks to Together We Grow Phoenix, the Hernandez family is ready for fun. We are going to trunk, trunk and tree, trunk and tree. The nonprofit program put on an event to hand out free costumes that were donated. And so we just want to make it, we just want to make their day a little bit brighter and their Halloween a, a little bit nicer. During the event, the kids painted pumpkins and picked up goodie bags. They also wrote thank you notes to the donors who made it all possible. Thanks to donations from volunteers, 60 kids are going to come away with costumes for Halloween this year. She got My Little Pony and then my older one got Groats from Galaxy the Guardians. And then my other one has Spider-Man. And my niece has got the Prince of Disney princesses. Hernandez says she's thankful for the costumes and the activities that brought the community together. In Phoenix, Sierra Delgado, Cronkite News. Next month, Together We Grow will be partnering with 25 ASU student volunteers to provide brunch and dinner boxes to families in need ahead of Thanksgiving. Anyone is welcome to donate. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of Cronkite News. For more multimedia coverage, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org and click on the Consumer tab.